LSD, magic mushrooms, ecstasy. Since the 1960s, hallucinogenic drugs have mostly been associated with counterculture rebellion and recreational abuse. But researchers say experiments now underway may prove hallucinogens useful in treating everything from depression to cluster headaches to post-traumatic stress. Joining me now are Rick Doblin, executive director of the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, and Marilyn Howell, whose late daughter was treated with LSD and ecstasy as part of her hospice care. Welcome to both of you. Yes. Marilyn, you have an incredible story to tell. Right near the end of your daughter Mara's life, you got associated with Rick's group and got her a prescription, essentially, for... Um, That's not entirely the case. Um, while I was told and called Rick to see if there were any studies available, there were none at the time. Um, that, and she was incapable of any sense of peace. Um, she was, we tried every prescription medication mm -hmm. available. So uh, I had heard about a, a study at McLean Hospital that was using um, MDMA, uh, ecstasy, for end of life. Um, anxiety and depression and, um, and and it relieves pain too and yes it can definitely relieve pain um, but that study wasn't ready and um, that he that uh, psychiatrist uh, told me about maps and Rick uh, and there were I called him there was nothing available at that time so but you did eventually find I, somebody. I found somebody uh, Alan and, and Alan an underground therapist who um, out of compassion Oh, wanted to help. Mm. So over a series of three months, the last three months of her life, she had six different psychedelic sessions and they were really the only times when she was pain-free, uh, when she could experience joy in her life. Um, so it was a quite a profound uh, experience for her and, and certainly for me and at the end uh, for her father as well. Mm. Uh, when everything seemed so desolate when there's this little bright shining moment uh, from time to time um, when she was back to being herself um, and when she died. That is amazing because we think of psychedelic drugs of course as being you know you're out of your mind you don't have your thoughts. Rick how did your group come to I mean it's the experiments are now legal yes. but how did you discover how did anybody discover that some of these drugs are useful for this kind of thing as opposed to what frankly most of us associated with in the 60s and 70s is recreational, mind-altering, you know, fun. Yeah. Well, I mean, I wish I could take credit for discovering it, but we didn't. Um, LSD and MDMA have been used quite a lot by underground psychedelic psychotherapists and psychologists. And in particular in the 1960s, there was research with a drug called MDA that's somewhat similar to MDMA. Which and, and one of them is ecstasy, and the other well, is... MDMA is yeah. ecstasy. And so, um, when MDA was made illegal in around 1975, a lot of chemists were looking around to tinker with the different molecules to come up with substances that were legal. And so, MDMA was developed in this way, and then it was used in underground psychedelic therapy circles. About a half a million doses were used from around the middle 70s to the early 80s. And what most people don't realize is ecstasy really began as a therapy drug. Hmm. And it was people who used it in this therapeutic context. One of them thought, aha, here's a way to make a lot of money and to provide drugs that people would really appreciate. And so it became ecstasy and it became marketed in a public way. And that's what attracted the attention of the DEA to I try see. to criminalize it when it was being used in bars and sold at nightclubs and sold it with 800 numbers. And so I was aware I was wanting to be a therapist and I was aware of the use of these drugs for therapy and I learned about MDMA when it was still legal and I recognized that because of the mindset of the war on drugs that it would become illegal as in a short period of time so I helped organize a group of psychiatrists and psychologists and then we tried to protect the therapeutic use of MDMA with a lawsuit against the DEA which we won the lawsuit mm -hmm. but the DEA made it illegal anyway and in 1986 is when I started MAPS to move it through the FDA system. I see. Well, Marilyn, in the three months that your daughter Mara took these drugs, when she wasn't taking it, did the after effects of it help her or did she crave more of it? I mean, did she then want to get to that next level because she remembered it was 
it was it felt good or gave her peace of mind? It's a little more complex than that. Um, when um, she first took um, MDMA with this, the guidance of a therapist, and I acted as co-therapist, um, she was really hoping for a mystical experience, for some transformative healing. Um, I had given up hope. We'd been through so many protocols and so on. Um, I was really interested in the uh, be at peace, um, be able to talk about death. She pushed away anyone that, that wanted to mention death. So we had this sort of dual motivations. Um, and so she had these very positive experiences, but she wanted something that was more powerful, more likely to open up her psyche, more likely to have this transcendent experience. So um, after these initial two sessions with MDMA, uh, she wanted something stronger. And um, so uh, there was a third session using magic mushrooms. The psilocybin is the magic. And um, it didn't seem to have much effect because she was deteriorating rapidly. By that point, she was on 15 different drugs. Mm. Um, so the psilocybin didn't have much effect until uh, she used some marijuana. Oh, that's and right. um, marijuana had the effect not so much of eliminating all pain, but changing her attitude toward it. Mm. She said, I still feel some pain, but it's not me. She didn't identify with it. She could distance herself from it, um, be more of an observer rather than a victim. Um, but she was disappointed that she didn't get her miracle. Um, mm. So she wanted, she wanted to go for the strongest uh, psychedelic, which was LSD, um, which was her fourth session. Mm. So, uh, Rick, are there other examples like this one that Marilyn went through that have that, had that kind of success? Yeah, the there successes, are. Successes, but you know, yeah, the, there's quite a few. Order. There's quite a few. That's yeah. why I think that these drugs will play a role in the hospice movement in the future. But it's going to take us about 10 years or so to make them into prescription medicines. Yeah. We have a study in Switzerland with LSD with end of life. There's three studies at NYU and Johns Hopkins and UCLA with psilocybin that's sponsored by another organization. And then the study at McLean Hospital with MDMA for cancer patients. And, mm -hmm. and all these examples of people who can't wait who find underground therapists. All right, Rick Dabble, Marilyn Howell, thanks so much for coming here today. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Pleasure. All right, when we continue, a coach for the game of life.